Without further ado, um, my name is Ike Kang. I am assistant director and chief curator here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And I am so pleased that you're able to join us for this very, very special symposium in conjunction with the exhibition De La Croix and the Matter of Finish, which is uh, on view right now upstairs. Um, unfortunately, the exhibition won't be available until we open to the general public at 11, but during the lunch break, if you haven't already seen the show, hopefully uh, you'll have a chance to run upstairs and take a look. Um, I am going to speak very little because the point of today's program is to allow those who really possess de la Croix, the specialists, to speak to you all. I feel very much like I borrowed the painter from my colleagues for a brief period of time um, in the service of this problem of attribution that rather fell from the sky on my head in a happy way. Um, and, and you know, I just wanted to open by telling you a little bit about that experience and about what emerged for me as some of the more um, seminal problems of our discipline um, just in this exercise of attribution. So I'm showing you this painting because we just acquired it. And um, it's also featured in the exhibition and it's a, a very proud day for us that we can say that we are, uh, possess this beautiful oil sketch um, by De La Croix and you will find it in the show. But this is the star for us. Um, this is the raison d'etre in some ways for the exhibition. Um, so this is the painting you may have seen in some of the local press and also in that article in the Wall Street Journal um, that this painting was discovered in a local collection here in Santa Barbara. And it is a, now we call it affectionately, the Santa Barbara variant of a well-known composition by De La Croix, the last words of Marx Aurelius, the prime version of which is housed in Lyon. So it's unsigned. It does not have an absolutely, completely ironclad provenance, although it has a very distinguished provenance in that it has been in the same family, a uh, very noble and distinguished Swiss family for all this time since the 19th century. Um, but it is always a question as to how to determine authenticity, especially in a day and age where Connoisseurship isn't really practiced in the way that it once had been. And of course, in our field, the problem is that Lee Johnson, the great art historian who produced this multi-volume catalogue raisonné that we all use, is no longer with us. He passed away in 2006. I have never even met him before. I suppose some of you have met him, um, but I haven't. And um, it's, it's been a very interesting challenge to figure out uh, what to do in, in a situation like this where he dominated the field for so long. And there are very puzzling things that emerge in association with this uh, particular composition, which exists in various versions, including um, this extremely interesting, um, I'm not sure what to call it, sketch copy is what the Lee Johnson called it. Um, we have it on view in the exhibition precisely because it allows you to compare it to the Santa Barbara variant and to test for yourself my hypothesis, my conviction that our painting is actually completely autograph. It is signed, but I believe that it's probably collaborative, um, probably uh, mostly the work of Pierre Andrieux, who was one of his uh, best known collaborators and so-called students. But this is the big version in Lyon, which we were not able to borrow because of issues of condition. It's so large that you would have to fold it in the painting since its creation actually suffered from issues having to do with a rather mediocre fabric support that he used. Um, but in any case, at least we were able to reproduce it in the installation and in this fabulous digital age, even vinyl reproductions can convey at least a sense of the monumental proportions of a painting like this one. Um, the corrective that we're trying to offer in this exhibition, um, in its modest proportions, I think we're still communicating the whole idea of how ambitious de la Croix actually was as a public painter. Um, you're not often able to borrow the monumental um, Grandes Machines, the great history paintings that you find housed in the Louvre, for example, um, but at least we can give you a sense of the monumentality of these great compositions, and then you appreciate um, the difference psychologically in interpretive terms when you come to the easel-sized versions that are most um, frequently on display in American museums and in exhibitions like ours. 
And you see here we've highlighted the two reliefs in the background of the Lyon version. Um, this was our bit of discovery in that these were so badly, I think, uh, sunken in tonality that you can no longer read them. But it turns out that they can be identified, which we were able to do um, through the magic of Photoshop. But um, also um, my junior colleague recognized um, these monuments as they were translated, probably known through reproductive prints. So this was a bit of discovery that we were able to offer to um, Lyon. Um, also, one of the great uh, advancements, at least in terms of digital photography, is something called spectral imaging. And with spectral imaging, you are able to zoom in to an incredible degree. And this is one way in which you can also test authenticity, uh, from my point of view, because normally when you dig in visually to an image at such a superhuman um, degree, the painting degrades if it is not well executed. And in our case, it does not whatsoever. And if you have time to play with the app that is available on some iPads upstairs and zoom into the image, you will find uh, the complexity of mark making and the subtlety of hue that is so characteristic of Delacroix and so difficult to emulate. The infrared and x-ray also show many pentimenti, so that means adjustments to the composition. Um, this is very uh, typical of an artist reworking an idea rather than a straight rote copy by a student or a follower, in which case you would find no changes. It does um, seem as well that our version is distinguished from the Lyon version in many subtle ways that I explored in my essay and that I ask you to enjoy um, in your own uh, observations upstairs. This is also an exhibition that allows us to maybe uh, re-excavate some questions of attribution, um, in this case a painting that had been demoted by Lee Johnson from the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and when I saw this in Brooklyn I immediately uh, found it suspicious that Lee Johnson would have questioned it because it's absolutely beautiful. It's ravishing in just the way that Duracroix is always ravishing when he's at his best. And I found in the file that Lee Johnson had um, decided to exclude it because it's too unfinished, quote unquote, in the background, which seemed like a fairly arbitrary judgment. Um, so it had been published by other scholars as autograph and we have decided to display it as such in our exhibition. And then there are very exciting new discoveries as well, such as this beautiful oil sketch, which, which is now um, available with a New York-based dealer. And um, I, again, would invite you to inspect this delectable oil sketch for a very, very famous painting um, that in its tonality has now sunken to such a degree. And this is a great opportunity to understand how brilliant oil sketches like this can inform us as to the original intended luminous palette um, and so that we can appreciate the degree to which the larger versions have now sunken and no longer can convey the incredible brilliant um, hue that De La Croix uh, was so celebrated for during his lifetime. So I'm going to keep my remarks very brief because as I say, what I would prefer is that we spend every second that we can enjoying the expertise of the fabulous scholars that we've been able to um, convene for this day. And um, rather than introduce them all individually, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves because we have given you full bios and um, little snapshots so that you can appreciate the depth of their experience. We've collected together people who are basically the stars of their fields of Delacroix studies. And in fact, if something happened to us all right now, Delacroix's legacy would probably be completely um, at an end. Um, <laughs> But we're, we're also happy to be able to include the expertise of um, conservators, and this is something that I always like to be able to, to do because it's so rare that we have a chance to um, really benefit from the expertise of individuals who know the material issues at hand. And in the case of Delacroix, if you, if you don't know him as an artist, it is one of the great tragedies, as uh, brilliant as he was and as pig-headed as he was in his willingness to uh, abandon known and conventional academic practice. This also meant that he experimented a great deal, and this has 
wreaked havoc with many of his works because he used very unorthodox materials, including wax, quick dry cicatives, and many things that have ended up um, really undermining his original intent. And the glorious color that we know must have been there to begin with is no longer there. So, you know, this is one of the issues that recurs, especially when it comes to problems of attribution, because obviously so many of these objects have had to be restored over their long lives, and that also mars and can interfere with your appreciation of the object. So there are many complex issues that can arise in looking at these things, and that is one of the objectives of the installation, is to allow for specialists and for non-specialists to go through the rather rewarding exercise of looking very carefully to try and distinguish the hand of the master from, from his followers. Um, I just want to also acknowledge, because I so rarely feel like I get the chance to do so, the, the wonderful staff of the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Um, in particular, I want to thank Liz Brown and Caitlin DeFady, who have put together a glorious, glorious day, and um, Monday is Scholars' Day as well, and organized everything so perfectly to a T. Um, and I have to acknowledge again um, my director for allowing exhibitions and projects like this one to survive in this economic age. And that is, I can't tell you uh, how rare that is in our current museum culture. And uh, our supporters of the museum, we should all be very proud. Um, my my uh, support group, the Dead Artists Society, um, actually um, uh, supported this particular symposium in Scholars Day. Um, and it really, the museum, I think, is at such a pivotal moment of growth and um, wonderful change, and um, I think the future looks very bright. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy the program today. I hope my colleagues don't mind that I'm not giving them the extra special red carpet introduction treatment, but I do think my having to get up and sit down and get up and sit down and spend a lot of time saying things that everyone probably should already know about your wonderful careers. I, I hope it's worth it to spend more time actually talking about our artist. Um, thank you very much for coming, and I do hope you enjoy the program. So Nina will be coming up first to give us the uh, state of the field. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Ike, for inviting me to be part of this symposium and also for creating this event and, in fact, having the courage, because it takes courage to deal with the Lacroix these days as all my colleagues here present know, it takes courage to really create a two-day event around this otherwise forgotten artist. And that only happens, I hate to say, in this country, because you go across the ocean, and in France, Delacroix is the national artist, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, maybe that's because of it. Anyway, we won't discuss this point any further. Um, and. Um, I, uh, for this introductory presentation, um, yes, I did start thinking about the state of the field, and then suddenly I decided to um, somehow, always within the idea of creating a broader picture of the time and circumstances of Delacroix's life and work, to focus on what I think is a key issue, one that's called forth actually by the subject of our exhibition, Delacroix's classicism, a topic of crucial significance for understanding the complexities of his imagery and style, as I think, but also one that leads us to explore more broadly the larger context and status of mid-19th century classicism as it evolved beyond academic parameters to become a contested aesthetic field between rival classicist traditionalists and romantic modernists. What did the notion of classicism and of a classical aesthetic mean for Delacroix, a man who, when hailed as le lion romantique, the romantic lion, retorted, je suis un pur classique, I'm a pure classic. How can we reconcile his classical imagery with his unclassical, impetuous brushwork, of which Ike has written abundantly, ambiguously located, or located between states of finish and unfinish? And was the classicist impulse only to be understood one way, 
the David Anger and Academy way, or was it a shifting pivot protean concept, an aesthetic hydra of sorts, impossible to annihilate because always and continuously regenerated from within? My entry point uh, will be, as expected, Delacroix's last words of Marcus Aurelius, which I'm showing here in its um, larger and completed version at the exhibited at the Salon of 1845. As Ike has shown in her thought-provoking essay, the painting's composition is in direct line with the tradition of the exemplum virtudis, the depiction of the last moments of an exemplary individual extolled as a paragon of moral and civic virtue. Delacroix recasts the scene to feature at the center the dying emperor philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, on a couch, surrounded by a group of fellow philosophers and by Commodus, his son and heir to the throne, who was destined to become one of Roman history's most despised emperors, along with Nero and Caligula. A great favorite of 18th century artists, by the early 19th century, the exemplum virtutis theme had become a chestnut of academic instruction and was pretty much the indispensable rite of passage for academic painters and members of the neoclassical school. The first question then that pops to mind is what was someone like Delacroix, author of a pathbreaking paintings that sealed his reputation as the leader of romantic modernism, and here I'm showing his death of Sardanapalus. What was Delacroix trying to do by engaging such a subject? Sure enough, as a product of a French lycée, he had acquired a solid background in the classics, further amplified by, the training, by his training as a student at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. For his Marcus Aurelius, he undoubtedly sought out, among other sources, ancient histories of the lives of Roman emperors, such as by Herodian, Dio Cassius, and the multi-authored Historia Augusta, all of which include vivid accounts of Marcus Aurelius' last moments. But although lavishing praise on the emperor's wise and generous nature, the texts are less enthusiastic when it comes to his relation with his only son. How could such a virtuous and selfless man, the top subtext is, could knowingly entrust the future of the glorious Roman Empire to a blatantly incompetent, indeed ignominious heir? For as we read in the Historia Augusta, it was evident early on that the young prince, quote, was based and dishonorable and cruel and lewd, defiled of mouth and debauched, unquote. While still a child, he had ordered a slave thrown live into a blazing furnace. As an adolescent, he was prone to excessive drinking, gambling, and spending freely. He kept his own private brothel within the palace, while also making a public display of his homoerotic relationship with a handsome ar army officer. Though such behavior was the cause of much anxiety to his father, the historian Dio Cassius points out, the latter turned a blind eye determined as he was to see his bloodline continue on the imperial throne. And I should say that five emperors before Marcus Aurelius, including Marcus Aurelius himself, had been adopted by Roman emperors. Um, Marcus Aurelius had been adopted by Hadrian. So it's not that there was not other alternatives. Accordingly, Marcus Aurelius kept heaping titles and honors on his offspring, naming him Imperator and his co-emperor at age 15, and Augustus and the consul of the Roman Senate at age 16. Even when lying on his deathbed, the story goes, he dismissed rumors that his final, final illness may have been the result of a plot to poison him, hatched by Commodus in conspiracy with his physicians. As I have heard on good evidence, Dio Cassius writes, for he, Marcus Aurelius, did not wish his death to appear to be his commodities fault." Unquote. Of such accounts, Delacroix seems to have been well aware, as his catalog description for the Salon of 1845 indicates. The brief text opens with a declaration of commodities' perverse nature as a disqualifier for his future role. 
I'm quoting, the perverse inclinations of Commodus had already been come, become manifest. And concludes, the Lacroix text, with an allusion to the gloomy bystander's bemused wonder at the conceited nature of their leader's recommendations. La vanité de ses recommandations. Is it his way to steer us into seeing Marcus, or is it, I'm sorry, is this de la Croix, is this de la Croix planting the seed of doubt in his reader viewer's mind? Is it his way to steer us into seeing Marcus Aurelius' final push in favor of his delinquent son as less than an exemplary act, indeed as an act that hovers uncertainly between a father's love and a ruler's self-indulgence and lack of civic responsibility, <coughs> let alone a, betray a betrayal of a stoic philosopher's beliefs, afloat in moral limbo, the message of the image thus parts ways with the stark moral certainties projected by the typical exemplum virtudis, being Groza's Septimius Severus, summoning his last strength to forcefully denounce his son Caracalla for plotting his assassination, or even more potently, David's darkly brooding Junius Brutus, as the lictors bring back home the bodies of his sons beheaded by his own order for conspiring to overthrow the Roman Republic. Built along the lines of the exemplum virtutis formula, we all agree on that, De La Croix Marcus Aurelius explodes the boundaries of the genre indeed seems to question its viability altogether. Picked out by the spotlight, the closely bonded figures of father and son locate the moral conundrum of the scene at the heart of the composition. The pair emits conflicting, fluid, and interchangeable physical and moral signals, plunging even the most favorable critics at the Salon of 1845 in a state of confusion. Slumped on the bed, Marcus Aurelius' livid figure, molded with green and yellow shadows, appears drained of blood, but voided too of moral strength and willpower. An entirely cadaverous, decomposing body, where Théophile Gautier's words, disapprovingly so, in La Presse, a moribund, so moribond, that seems worn out by debauchery, as Edouard Bourguignon in the Revue de Paris. We thought Commodus was a debauched one, right? <laughs> by contrast, Commodus is pointedly a feet, willowy silhouette, pink, soft, and voluptuous, in Baudelaire's words, proclaims his vitality while also declaring another form of troubling fragility. Father and son are linked as tandem beings, the father clutching his son's arm as if in a desperate last bid for affection, the son narcissistically self-absorbed and emotionally a stranger to the solemnity of the event. Il a l'air de s'ennuyer, Baudelaire notes, a fact made obvious by his eagerness to disengage his arm from the paternal clasp, which Gautier noted his arm that he obviously tries to free from the hand of his father, he writes. And yet, no matter how manifest the physical marks of his depraved nature, it is that radiant figure of the dissolute prince that rivets our attention. With his lean, muscular body wrapped in a flaming red mantle, his rosy complexion accented by the dull glow of gold ornaments, an expression of sly disdain floating on the perfect oval of his face, Commodus is wickedly yet irresistibly seductive de la Croix's flower of evil incarnate. His beauty harks to forbidden pleasures and the lure of sin. His ennui unveils the incipient tediousness of the proverbial high moral ground represented by the sullen figures in drab clothing of his father's worthy advisors. A living proof of the triumph of the senses over reason, of corruption over integrity, and of evil over good. In his celebrated preface to his play, Cromwell of 1827, a powerful manifesto of the re re uh, Romantic movement, Victor Hugo proclaimed the dual nature of a new modern ideal of beauty, 
at once sublime and grotesque, lofty and mundane. If the sublime stood for an exalted humanity, the repulsive grotesque symbolized la bête humaine, the beast within, with its extreme passions, its vices, and its crimes. Antiquity, Hugo argued, provided an example for such conceptual and aesthetic pairings. Side by side with the serenely beautiful gods of Olympus, the ancient spirit had given birth to an array of monstrous beings, tritons, satyrs, cyclopes, sirens, and furies. Horror and evil, as much as beauty and goodness, formed inner and part of the new classicism's aesthetic vocabulary, one situated at the antipodes of the academic mainstream stream and its attending values of noble simplicity and quiet grandeur. You will remember Winkelmann's famous pronouncement. This new beauty, the result of a blend of opposites, reflected the realities of humankind and of nature. Shorn of unattainable ideals and inhabited by heroes with clay feet and resplendent villains, it will be Delacroix's classical domain. By the second decade of the 19th century, indeed, the Winkelmannian vision of antiquity as a superhuman elsewhere, peopled with marmorial demigods, and given, had given way to a more complex, more blended view of the ancient past. Ongoing excavations in the Bay of Naples, in Pompeii and Herculaneum, had revealed the life of ordinary Romans as distant yet familiar mirrors of a perennial humanity, ridden with vices and virtues in equal dose. Walking through the Capitoline Museum, the writer Stendhal pronounced the Apollo of Belvedere an obsolete myth. While in Italy in 1817, Jericho was beset by visions of the country's classical past as a world throbbing with lust, cruelty, and violence, alive in the present. A vision not unlike the resurrected antiquity of Arabs in togas, of reborn Brutuses and Caters, at once sublime and barbarous, note the power play below, that Delacroix discovered in North Africa in 1832. In 1857, Upon seeing Jericho's paintings representing severed limbs or dissect of dissected subjects, composed as still lifes of morbid horror, Delacroix was once again overpowered by that same fatal attraction for the beauty of the object. <coughs> he pronounced the artful tangles of mangled limbs admirable and sublime. And I quote, it proves more than ever that there is no serpent or odious monster. This is the best argument in favor of the beautiful, the new beautiful, right? As it should be understood, unquote. A mythic incarnation of the allure of evil, Medea, the heroine of Euripides' play, and a subject that had fascinated Delacroix since the 1830s, dashes forward, knife in hand, incensed with jealousy and, and uh, vindictiveness and clutching her children that she's about to kill. Delacroix models his composition after Andrea del Sarto's allegory of charity at the Louvre. But as with the Marcus Aurelius, in the Medea as well, the meaning of the original source is inverted, transformed from image of ideal nurturing motherhood to its blood chilling opposite, infanticidal fury. Echoing Hugo's phrase of la bête humaine, critics at the Salon of 1838, the first version of the painting was um, exhibited at the Salon of 1838, likened Medea to a savage lioness. In his review for La Presse, Gautier saluted the painter's lifelike retooling of a conventional mythological subject as a provocative departure from tradition, indeed as a complete revolution, that's a quote. For Delacroix, it was precisely in such antinomies, <clears throat> in such antinomies that captured the truth of human nature that the spirit of antiquity resided. Reflecting on the meaning of the term classique for its projected Dictionnaire des Beaux-Arts, the painter railed against the lifeless antiquarian evocations of his academic contemporaries predicated upon more copies 
of ancient prototypes and a compilation of archaeological details met meticulously drawn. This was the phony antiquity of David and Ang from which he wished to be distanced. A mindless interpretation of the ancient past divorced from nature and ephemeral because of its subservience to period fashions. And we will hear it now from Delacroix's own mouth. The school of David has wrongly claimed to be the classical school by excellence. It is precisely this quite unintelligent and narrow-minded imitation which has deprived the school of the chief characteristic of ancient art, its quality of permanence. For rather than penetrating the spirit of antiquity and add to it the study of nature, David reflects a time when antiquity was only a fashionable trend." Unquote. Rather, Delacroix de goes on, antiquity's genuine spirit was to be found in artists like Rubens and Titian, and even the 17th century Dutch painters of everyday life, such as Teniers and Brouwer with their rowdy tavern scenes and everyday life uh, representation. These were the real classics, he announced, because the art echoed nature, fusing ideal beauty and deformity, virtue and vice. For Delacroix, classical was a universal, eternal value beyond specific chronologies and fashions, a notion that, like nature, defied time and change. In that sense, he proudly declared, je suis un peu classique. His Marcus Aurelius affirms the romantic revision of classicism. In his review of the painting at the Salon of 1845, the critic Théophile Torre, that fervent advocate of naturalism, wrote insightfully, and I'm quoting, but truly, Monsieur de, de Lacroix's romans rival those of David. They have more humanity, if one can put it that way. It isn't necessary to be cold and stilted to represent these great scenes of the antique world, unquote. But in the mind of 19th century critics, classicism also meant a particular formal and technical legacy. Linear forms and highly polished surfaces, sculpture, um, volumes looking like sculpture where its primary characteristics. Writing about the Marcus Aurelius in his review of the Salon of 1845, Etienne de Lecluse, the art critic of the Journal des Débats, a former student of David and a staunch supporter of traditional classicism, indignantly commented on what he considered an inappropriate disjunction between Delacroix's classical subject matter and its unfinished sketch-like execution, unworthy of its noble theme. Invoking linear severity, dignity, and tradition, the critic Arsène Rousset accused Delacroix of failing miserably in his attempt to improve on the great David. And I'm quoting from Rousset's review. In order to paint, Roma, paint Romans, one would need more respect for line, a greater severity of style. One should accept tradition, which represents Romans always as dignified, and draped with some degree of solemnity." Unquote. The critic's inability to reconcile classical content with a non-classical painterly manner ushers in the second part of my talk today, a discussion of the material aspects of Delacroix's painting, especially its emphasis on a fluid, free, and palpable tactile brushwork, a factor Delacroix deliberately foregrounded and on whose effects he meditated throughout his career. What did his pictorial tools, pigments, brushes, and palette represent for Delacroix, the painter-creator, and what role, more broadly, did technique and materiality play in the wider culture of Romanticism as it strove to define its boundaries against the norms of academic classicism? Foremost among the reasons for Delacroix's intensified emphasis on facture is what could be called, somewhat anachronistically, his belief in, truth, in a truth to material concept, a belief he embraced with a conviction of an ideology. As he saw it, every art corresponded to a particular medium, a privileged technical language, or, in his words, accepted means of expression and execution, 
that best fulfill that medium's visual and signifying goals. For painting, the medium par excellence was oil colors, <coughs> whose creamy, lush consistency required, indeed demanded to be shown off by means of an adequately, adequately thick and visible touch. Touch, la touche, has a had a multivalent agenda. It preserved the mark of the painter's distinctive manner. It denoted his control over his materials in rebuttal of classical accusations of haphazard romantic technique. And most importantly, it revealed, quote, our thought in painting, Delacroix writes. The spirited tactility of the painting surface thus acquired a life of its own as an active angel, agent in the production of meaning. In the pages of his journal, Delacroix deplored, deplored the classicist's obliteration of brushwork, and I have two details here from two other lists, one by Ang, of course, and the other by Delacroix, prompted, as he explains, by ill-conceived aspirations toward greater illusionistic naturalism. Many masters have avoided to show in their touch, he writes, thinking most certainly that they are getting closer to nature, which does not indeed contain any touches. But this is pure fallacy, he comments, for deprived of its maker's imprint, classicist painting loses its indi individuality and even its independence as an art object. It becomes a mere reflection the transparent vehicle of an illusion. The works of Vingres, says Delacroix, gleam like a mirror. You could look at yourself to shave, unquote. <laughs> Worse still, and as opposed to thoughtful, highly textured surfaces, polished surfaces suffered from an absence of thought. And he's a very imperfect cri critic he who cannot read these indications of the artist's thought, Delacroix writes, referring undoubtedly to the likes of Delacluse and Housset. Delacroix's keen awareness of his medium and facture reveals a little mentioned aspect of his pictorial practice, his fervent commitment to good craftsmanship. Pride in craftsmanship is indeed central to Delacroix's artistic identity and spans his entire career. It's attested by his meticulous preparation of his canvases and, of course, his directions to his um, students, including uh, Louis de Planet, who worked on the Marcus Aurelius. Um, his interest in learning about and embrace, embracing uh, progressive optical and color theories, his many technical entries in the Dictionnaire des Beaux-Arts, and, not the least, his habit of publicly displaying in his studio, as we saw in the catalog, in the catalog essays, his paintings accompanied by the palettes used for them, thus linking tool and product, craftsmanship as a process, to the paintings as artifacts. This is how I created this magnificent picture, he seems to say in this engraving from L'Illustration, as if in an effort to both demystify the creative act and at the same time appropriate, it for, appropriate for himself the aura of an alchemist magician able to turn crude man matter into gold. Technical expertise was a skill honed with time and effort, a moral rite of passage culminating in the final triumph of the maker's will over his recalcitrant medium. Technical, fa technical facility was to be shunned as unworthy of the artist's craftsmanship. In a diary entry of 1824, Delacroix admonishes himself. The most important issue is to avoid the devilish facility of the brush. Try rather to choose a medium that's difficult to work with, as if it were marble. Let us make matter rebellious so we can vanquish it with patience." Unquote. It is the gifted, gifted craftsman that Delacroix admired above all in the Italian violin virtuoso Niccolò Paganini, whose performances in Paris he attended in 1831. In his portrait of Paganini at the Phillips Collection in Washington, the musician's dark silhouette emerges from a somber background, holding close his violin, the tool of his craft and echo of his thought, with the same passionate attachment 
a painter clings to his brushes and palette. And you can actually see that the violin uh, is kind of, I would say, el elusively um, in between a palette and a musical instrument. Delacroix's impetuous lashes of color build up the violinist's vibrant shape, turning the silent pigment into the material, palpable body of sound of those wild Paganini rhythms that drove to a frenzy Parisian audiences. Technical virtuosity in painting meets its acoustic match. Apprenticeship, strict discipline, and intense labor were the secrets behind both, indeed behind all artistic achievement. This was the lesson to be learned from Paganini, Delacroix told his assistant, La Salborde. And I'm quoting, you have to be able to render easily in painting the thing that you envision. Your hand has to acquire great nimbleness, and you will only achieve that through study. Paganini acquired his astonishing skill on the violin only by practicing scales every day for an hour. We need the same exercise drawing every day." Unquote. Neither was visible stroke incompatible with a spirit of antiquity as classicists would have it. For contrary to common belief, antiquity made frequent use of visible brushstroke in order to achieve specific visual effects, Delacroix writes, and we listen to him. But in the antique, we are amazed by the daring and aptness with which certain technical devices, these brushstrokes properly called, were used to exaggerate the form in keeping with a given effect or to, softness, to soften the crudeness of certain contours in order to connect the different parts of the work between them. Delacroix's vision of ancient art as the nurturing ground or the nursing ground of an aestheticized materiality of touch dovetailed with the rise of an art for art's sake movement in the 1830s, spearheaded by the group of young romantic writers and poets who congregated around the writer critic Théophile Gautier. A, su a supporter of Hugo and Delacroix, Gautier launched a new perception of beauty in art as apprehended through the senses and of sensual pleasure as the ultimate vehicle of spiritual elevation. Moralizing or didactic content was to be banished. Any subject, be it moral or immoral, good or evil, sublime or horrific, ancient or modern, carried a potential for aesthetic delectation. Perfection of craftsmanship was the necessary precondition, the only precondition, I should say, for attaining that sensory aesthetic ideal. Quote, art is beauty. It is the exquisite care of execution, Gautier writes, and quote again, anything that's not well made does not exist, unquote. He situated the origins of this ideal in ancient Greece, whose artists he saw as primarily consummate craftsmen. In La, his poetic manifesto for an art for art's sake aestheticism, Gautier conjures the image of an ancient sculptor tenaciously at grips with precious yet intractable materials, onyx, marble, alabaster, bronze, as he strives to realize his aesthetic vision. In terms intriguingly analogous to those used by Delacroix, he urges artists, poets, sculptors, or painters to avoid the lure of easy making and seek instead the rewards of painstaking effort. Sculptor, he urges, carve, file, chisel. May your floating dream be sealed in the resistant block." Unquote. For Delacroix, it was precisely that well-crafted materiality of a painting of a painting's fabric that reached directly the viewer's soul. And I'm quoting, the more material the painter's art appears to be, the closer it touches the beholder, he reflected in his journal of 1822. By contrast, a classicist's smooth surface would leave the viewer cold. Having thus determined the superiority of his free brushstroke, the next question for him will be how to calibrate that stroke's freedom in order to meet the requirements of a finished painting. Just a quick look at the study versus finished composition of the Medea shows the validity, but also the enormity of his dilemma. Would a finished painting's tamer brushwork, as opposed to the spontaneous stroke of, of an abosh, detract from its ability to communicate with a viewer? 
Can the flights of the imagination spurred by a sketch be reenacted by the finished work? In a despondent mood, Delacroix jots down in his journal of 1853. One must always ruin a painting in order to finish it. <laughs> One must appear before the public by doing away with a happy carelessness, which is the passion of the artist, unquote. Then, one evening, while talking with a friend about art and music, he was struck by the luminous memory of Chopin's piano compositions, études, impromptus, sketchy, improvisations, fully thought out and finished works whose deceptively fluid, free, formal treatment and titles hearken to the unfinished spontaneity of the sketch. As for music, so with painting, Delacroix announces, when adopted for a finished painting and a Bosch-like technique, will be able to, pr to preserve some of the spontaneity of the first drafts. Taking heart again, no, he concludes triumphantly, a great artist does not destroy his work by finishing it. In giving up the vagueness of the sketch, he only shows his personality more clearly, unveiling the whole direction of his talent, but also its limits. But even that realization did not provide the desired peace of mind. For as Delacroix knew only too well, image making was an ever evolving, open ended process. Finish and unfinish were fluid, unstable notions, and completion and ultimately an attainable goal. For interposed between the creator and his work was a spectator, real or imagined, that unpredictable arbiter of a picture's final incarnation. We read in the journal, every painting, even the most finished one, is essentially unfinished, considering that every observer completes it, as in the case of an ebauche, in his own way." Unquote. The painter's role had its limitations. Finish was literally in the eye of the beholder. In the viewer's imaginative contemplation, Delacroix muses, a completed painting will always and ever retain something of the suspense quality of the ebauche. As a Delacroix scholar who doubles up as a student of Cezanne, I feel compelled to conclude this talk with a few words about the two painters' views regarding issues of finish and unfinish. Cezanne's lifelong admiration a true veneration, we could say, for Delacroix is, of course, a well-known fact of art history. The younger painter drew Delacroix's portrait twice, read Delacroix's journals when they were first published in the 1890s, read and reread Baudelaire's salon reviews, including Baudelaire's obituary essay of 1863, but most importantly, sketched after and copied several Delac Delacroix paintings, including, as you can see here, his Medea. To his biographer and friend, the poet Joachim Gasquet, Cezanne never tired of praising the romantic master whose sensuous physical forms, vibrant with jewel-like colors, he often contrasted with the dry linear paintings of David, Ingres, and Puvis de Chavannes, whom he dismissed as the adepts of bloodless classicism. He even, he, Cezanne, even undertook to create a large allegorical painting in in tribute to his hero, <laughs> an apotheosis of Delacroix. He worked on it in fits and starts <clears throat> throughout his life, but in the end, left it unfinished in the form of a small study, today at the Musée Granet in Aix-en-Provence, as we see here. Like Delacroix, too, Cézanne devoted much thought and anxiety to the issue of finish, what he called in his idiosyncratic way realizing my sensations. But in Cezanne's case, finish and unfinish appear under a double guise. For along with paintings like the Apotheosis of Delacroix, which are genuinely incomplete, and I should quickly say, because I didn't, uh, uh, the Apotheosis essentially puts Delacroix up in the sky. Uh, he's here uh, uh, in nude form, clearly idealized. Uh, his brushes and palette are held by two angels, which are cut here by my slide. <laughs> and underneath uh, his devotees 
uh, which include Monet here at the easel, Choquet the collector on the left, uh, and Cezanne himself here with a Provencal straw hat accompanied by his dog and others I won't bother you with, um, uh, kind of praying to him uh, <laughs> devotedly. So back to um, the idea of uh, finish though and my own finishing of, of this talk. So um, as I was saying, um, the <coughs> if we look at uh, painting here, it's genuinely unfinished. But if we look at this other Cezanne painting, uh, the Provencal lands landscape with pine trees, we this is a totally finished painting uh, by Cezanne standards. And we note the presence, however, uh, of uh, the pa patches of um, canvas here and also the lightness of coverage in areas uh, that make the painting uh, look as if it in parts was painted with watercolor. In that second category of paintings, in other words, finished paintings that use a technique of unfinished, that's what they say, um, the unfinished assumes the role of an autonomous technical conceit, not unlike Delacroix's a Bosch-like brushwork. Bare canvas patches in Cézanne and sketch-like brushwork in Delacroix work dynamically with the rest of the composition in the production of the painting's overall signifying emotive and aesthetic effect. And on the right, if you didn't recognize that, it's a detail from the Odalisque by Delacroix we saw earlier on. What further links the two artists is the thought, or maybe my thought, that they may have both deliberately embraced the technique of unfinished also as a form of symbolic protest. For whether as deliberately, uh, as mimicry of an ebauche style, de la Croix, or as autonomous pictorial reality, actively partaking of the process of representation, Cezanne, their use of unfinished effectively blurred the boundaries between notions of complete and incomplete, thereby dealing a lethal blow to a vital principle of academic doctrine, the absolute authority of perfect fini. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby, and I think there's still some arranging of seats here. I'm very <laughs> pleased to be here. I thank Icon for uh, making a Delacroix symposium happen. Nina, I think the last time we were at a symposium was in Philadelphia, and it was, what, 25 years ago? <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah, and um, it might be the last major Delacroix symposium in the United States, <laughs> which was 25 years ago, I believe. And I'm happy to follow Nina again. Um, I have published on Delacroix in a number of ways, but this uh, symposium made me revisit work from long ago. This is actually stems from my master's thesis that is a good 25 years ago uh, or more, and um, so it's been a very interesting experience and it's fun to follow Nina and think about Delacroix scholarship today and um, perhaps the difference of work that came out of a very particular moment in the history of art um, when I was a graduate student. But uh, let me share that work with you. Um, much of this is, originates from back then. Um, okay, so let's get started. Again, thank you, Ike. On July 29th, 1831, exactly one year after the glorious days of 1830, the critic for Le Correspondant described the strengths and weaknesses of Delacroix's painting of that revolution. This work, where one rediscovers the qualities and faults of the author, his long brush, his witty facility, his affected incorrectness, 
his systematic love of ugliness, was visibly inspired by the celebrated yam of Auguste Barbier. Witty facility and affected incorrectness, I think this writer's abutting of skill and its rejection is not half bad as art criticism. Note the aristocratic valence of the terms witty and affected and the acknowledgement of Delacroix's skill, his facility. Here before our eyes, we imagine a painting combining facility and wit, a painting that is ascendant, indicative of an elite culture, deriving pleasure from wit and affectation, perhaps one of Boucher's confections, in this case, Jupiter in the guise of Diana and Callisto of 1763. But the critic weighs down such imaginative flight, such artistic game playing, by conjoining wit and affectation to Delacroix's incorrectness, as well as his systematic love of ugliness. Wit and affectation are brought down to earth by the final phrase. Ugliness, need I say, is at once an aesthetic and a social category bound to the material world humans inhabit. Take, for example, Charles Joseph Traviez's lithograph from the year of revolution depicting a brawl between, these, uh, between three working class women and entitled, That Which is Ugliest in the Universe. Up and down we slam as we read Le Correspondent Critic's Wedding of Antitheses, much as we do before the painting itself. For this writer, the strength of Delacroix's art lay not in its isolated qualities, but rather in the painter's risks and mistakes. He proposes that the conspicuous signs of Delacroix's authorship were visibly discrete brushstrokes, facile and fluid brushwork implying speed that one could interpret as hasty and careless, or conversely as urgent and ardent, and finally, a self-conscious avoidance of correctness. I will return to this critic's reference to Barbier's famous poem of revolution. For now, I wish to emphasize that the writer for Le Correspondant was only one of many reviewers to recognize Delacroix's faults. Indeed, as scholars have long pointed out, numerous critics characterized the painting as a failure, especially denouncing its awkward, unresolved wedding of the allegorical personification of liberty and the gritty social description of the other protagonists, his slamming together, that is, of high and low. My emphasis here is that the stylistic debate engendered by Delacroix's painting did not pivot on whether or not the painting had its faults. Instead, those who defended Delacroix agreed with his detractors that the painting had conspicuous formal problems. Admirers, as well as detractors, acknowledged the incorrectness of the execution. Many of his supporters recognized the inconsistency of his paint handling and the faultiness of his drawing. Take, for example, the critic for Le Temps, who wrote, without doubt, one does not expect on the part of Delacroix a great correction of drawing, an execution everywhere equal and sustained. But what amateurs rediscover with pleasure are the profound sentiment, the emotion, the vigor of expression. Or take Auguste Jal, who aligned the painter's stylistic defects with his originality as well as his bizarreness in order to insist that his mistakes and achievements were inseparable. You have to take Monsieur Delacroix whole with his special character. The defects of his qualities, his originality and bizarre, his, his originality, his bizarreness, and the strangeness of his style. He is a man all of one piece. You cannot love him or hate him indifferently. What almost all critics shared was the belief that Delacroix's painting was incorrect, or at least riven by mistakes. Yet this incorrectness constituted the very basis for some critics' positive reviews. Why this would be so in the context of revolutionary politics requires some further unpacking. 
It is difficult even to see Delacroix's painting now. So iconic has it become. So many bills and stamps has it adorned. So often has it been emulated <laughs> and also parodied. Even vandalized recently by a woman described as deranged. And art history has been oddly reticent about this canonical picture. Marcia Poynton's essay of 1986, quite a long time ago, is one of the exceptions compared, for instance, to the lively in, um, literature inspired by Manet's Olympia. Perhaps Delacroix's painting appears a cliché, too simple, or too heavy-handed, or too explicitly political, not artfully complex enough. But to describe the painting as simple or trite suggests that it is coherent and unified in ways that even a cursory examination challenges. After all, the painting is strange and incongruous and places us as viewers in an untenable, uncomfortable position. Liberty strides forward toward us above the disproportionately small figures of the dead and dying squeezed into the relatively narrow foreground. In Delacroix's preparatory sketches, um, featuring a writhing, curvaceous, seductive, nymphish uh, girl. Liberty's head was depicted in three-quarter view. Her gaze mediates the space before and behind her. In the final painting, Delacroix places her head in strict profile. An almost distended pupil exaggerates her attention to those behind her. The split gaze of his sketches is replaced by an inflexible profile view that decisively divides foreground from background, horizontality from verticality, the dead from the living. Thus, while her body is oriented towards the dead, her face looks behind her to the living. The dead appear merely the indifferent landscape over which she treads. We, by contrast, are accorded no such obliviousness to human sacrifice to the human sacrifice in the foreground. Our viewpoint is low, down on the ground, amongst the heap. The central kneeling boy, wearing red, white, and blue, gazes up at liberty and provides an explicit figuration of, the, of our subordinate vantage point. We, like him, look up her body, look up to the realm of the living who charge toward us. In more ways than one, Delacroix's painting places the viewer in an ambiguous position. If Liberty's followers lie behind her, what is our status? Martyrs to the cause, fodder um, for the living, the enemy to be overcome? Does the transfixed, crouching boy holding a paving stone at far left intend to hurl it at us? Delacroix's inversion of the orientation of Jericho's raft of the Medusa was decisive here. That picture famously turns its back to us, allowing us to identify with the swell of figures seen from the back rising to the triumphant black man waving his banner at the diminutive rescue ship on the horizon. By contrast, Delacroix's protagonists face us and threaten to mow us down. The painting's cast is also compromised by the strange compression of the composition and the apparent haste of execution. Here are figures who are discrepantly proportioned, enigmatically motivated, quickly drawn, and ambiguously placed in a shallow space whose physical coordinates are uncertain. After all, we confront figures arranged on a provisional barricade, a street upturned and disassembled into an uneven, unpredictable pile of paving stones and wooden planks. Ascertaining the ground level for individual figures is consequently difficult. Generally, we do not see the lower bodies of the tableau standing protagonists. Never do we see two feet meeting the ground, as opposed, for example, um, to the planted feet in Jacques-Louis David's Intervention of the Sabines of 1799. David thought in terms of academies, whole nudes. He typically made full-length studies for figures, 
even when he knew they would be overlapped. He imagined placing complete volumetric bodies on the stages of his box-like spaces. Delacroix, by contrast, thought in terms of corporeal fragments stitched into a composition conceived two-dimensionally. Space is carved out provisionally, here and there, in order to provide for the figures. Liberty and the boy at right are each provided a plank upon which one foot rests. The top-hatted man is also provided a wooden beam on which he kneels with one leg. All three of these prominent figures have one obfuscated leg that extends to a ground level we cannot see. If Delacroix's painting is rife with illogical spatial relationships, contradictory allegiances, and opposing vectors of movement, so too is the figure of liberty, which upon examination fissures into contradictory aspects, a resolutely frontal body, contrasted to a diminished profile head, the sturdy perpendicularity of exposed torso contrasted to an illegible curvaceous swell beneath her skirt, the oddly emphatic orbs of her breasts frustratingly forever deprived of distinguishable nipples, contrasted to the flat strip of brown representing her backlit upraised arm, the spheres of her breasts also contrasted to her flattened iconic profile, their nakedness so boldly contrasted to her covered lower body swathed in thick folds with its mysterious anatomy, one knee disproportionately high and awkwardly twisting inward, the other leg entirely absent. Liberty's body is astonishingly incongruous and it is also incomplete. Delacroix seems, for instance, never to have resolved the anatomical construction of the entire Liberty figure. His preparatory sketches consistently omit the woman's leg at left. Strangely, in his studies for, her, um, for the Sabines, Jacques-Louis David also failed to conceive of the, his heroine, Hercilia's entire body. In studies and painting, she is missing the leg at right much like the figure of Greece in Delacroix's Missolonghi of 1827. Why were these painters unable to describe the logic of the body's symmetry when they concentrated on the female heroines to be placed at the very center of their compositions? Even as they imagined a woman be bearing metaphorical significance, they left her incomplete, we might say amputated, at the very least, not entirely knowable. No surprise that Delacroix's female personification of liberty made many of his viewers uncomfortable in 1831. Many, as we all know, saw her as dirty or sale, a word connoting lower class status and also prostitution. Take, for example, the review in Annal du Musée. Liberty, an entirely allegorical personage in whose force, heroic beauty, and virile energy of physiognomy should constitute uh, its principal attributes is here only a dirty and dishonest or immodest woman of the streets. Or that in La Tribune, here truly is the revolution as doctrinaires would wish it, that is an object of horror and disgust. This liberty who guides the people resembles the most ennoble courtesan of the dirtiest streets of Paris. Jal, in his assumed aristocratic voice, Pantomère de Beaugency, wrote, the figure of liberty, does it seem to you beautiful as she should be? Where is the grandeur, the nobility, the elegance of the goddess? In this girl who has the air of a slut, I do not see the strong woman whose gaze makes kings tremble and who, with a wave of her hand, reverses thrones. And then how is she draped? Her petticoat barely covers her body, whose forms the artist draws badly. Delacroix has undressed his liberty from above solely, it seems, in order to give him the pleasure of painting a dirty throat and arms. Surely Delacroix's decision to contrast liberty's backlit arm to the white ground of the tricolor flag um, exacerbated matters. 
The darkened silhouette of the upraised arm flattens her body, and the cropping um, does it all the more so. Um, and uh, backlit form threatens to sever the body. Wait a minute. The darkened silhouette of the upraised arm flattens her body and stresses the abrupt transition between the figure and ground. Yet in this criticism, light and shadow become overdetermined terms for social analysis. The backlit form threatens to sever the body and separate it into its constituent parts. Reducing modeling and contrasting the arm's dark brown coloration to the white background reverses the traditional convention of depicting fair women against a dark background and thereby invited anxieties concerning liberty's dirtiness, darkness, social impurity. The painter's formal choices permitted even exacerbated suspicions regarding the figure's physical integrity that had ampl implications for its semantic legibility. No surprise that several critics argued that Delacroix's liberty failed to maintain her status as an abstraction. Writing for Le Moniteur Universel, one critic asked the key question. Finally, because Monsieur Delacroix has no scruple uniting allegory to truth, painting the goddess of liberty in the middle of a Parisian insurrection, doesn't he need at least to mark a sensible difference between material beings and this mythological figure? The normative allegorical body is, after all, intended to function as a seamless whole to which external signs can be appended. Conventional personifications, such as this example, uh, rely on a reading of the body as an entirety, its completeness functioning as the equivalent of a whole or complete idea. Fragmentation suggests a semantic incoherence. Personification, therefore, depends on the competent execution of technical skills that assert the formal integrity of the depicted body. Can I just show you two more? Whether denouncing or celebrating Delacroix's pictures, critics repeatedly oppose high style, requiring the research that they note Delacroix abhors, mm -hmm. and an assertively common woman. The critic for Le Constitutionnel, for example, contrasts the body of a noble type with Delacroix's figure of liberty. One says that she is ugly, disagreeable to see, repugnant. Certainly, she could have been a prettier type, of a cleaner color, a more noble adjustment. But we pardon her in consideration of her force and powerful action. The aesthetic values of force, power, and action that we have associated with the execution of the painting are here located on the female figure. The faults of the working class body, like that of an incorrect artistic style, are forgiven. Nevertheless, the critic is compelled to describe what this body is not, and thus constructs its opposing term, a pretty, proper, noble type. The critic for La France Nouvelle also relies on such an opposition. We fall from one extreme to another, there too much coquetry, here the opposite fault. Certainly we are weary of liberties with white skin, six feet tall, and who resemble the opera down to their fingernails. But if we must personify the liberty of the three days of the July Revolution, is it necessary to use a young vivandière, the working class woman who fed the troops? This reviewer is aware that the monumental figures with alabaster skin cannot be redeemed, yet he also cannot accept this lower class cook as the only alternative. In order to describe the decadence of the Beaux-Arts, another critic, in this case writing for Le Mercure, also elided art in the represented bodies of women. And I show you once again Blondel's um, Charter of 1830 as a visual cue. Oh, so many rose or green, blue or red nudities. Oh, the Beaux-Arts. Incapable of feeling, we have stolen from the past types which represent nothing to us but our debasement. The great discussion rests on these types, which seduce the eye by their ravishing form, by the charm of their wax figures, pale with blue eyes, and blonde hair falling on white shoulders. Above all, and as an exception to this banality, the liberty on the barricades by Delacroix, who has habituated us to his masterpieces, the strong woman with powerful breasts, with her hearty air, 
her allures of a girl, once again citing Barbier's poem. In 1831, after two political revolutions, the stock signs of allegorical stability and the derelict symbols of past cultures and regimes can no longer function without evoking competing claims, competing values. Nudes are types stolen from the past that fail to represent anything but contemporary debasement. Important here is the fact that the female nude no longer functions as a synchronic term. It has become impossible to read it outside history. Instead, the female body splinters into a set of types. It can only be defined relationally. Style and history are read on the woman's body. Delacroix is only one of a host of modern artists whose radical style was read as a disavowal of the synchronic and universal status of the female nude. Moreover, allegory's capacity to speak relies on a narrative reading of spatial disposition. Looking back at Blondel's painting, The Charter of 1830, and I apologize that we're, I'm relying on such an inadequate image here, we see the way allegory is read spatially. Foot forward as though in mid-stride, a naked woman stands above two men and one woman who writhe in various contorted poses upon the ground. The attributes identify the charter as truth, victorious over male hypocrisy and despotic monarchy and female disorder. Here, a series of oppositions convey meaning, above versus below, vertical versus horizontal, central versus peripheral, light versus dark, frontal versus profile, whole body versus partial body, as well as other binaries founded on a knowledge of human behavior calm versus agitated, assurance versus uh, desperation, and so forth. Crucially, the placement of a figure above the others implies a verb, an action of the former upon the latter, a causal relation between them. The figures are on the ground because the standing figure has triumphed over them. The truth is unthreatened, truth of the, that represents the charter, is unthreatened because she ignores them and looks straight ahead. Delacroix's painting exploits a similar composition but problematizes the reading of the relationship between the figures. The mixture of registers, the melange of abstraction and the real, confound the viewer's capacity to read spatial and causal relationships with any confidence. The cues are contradictory and ambiguous. The result is unsettling. Nudity may designate the female figure's allegorical status but the man at left is also half naked. Further, the nudity of this male body is a singularly unstable cue to an appropriate reading. This figure oscillates between heroic and pillaged nude. The latter reading is compounded by an implied narrative of looting. Why is he without his pants and one sock? In the press, looting was forcibly denied on a daily basis by those aggrandizing the revolution. Equally comforting in a painting purportedly celebrating revolution is the heightened sexual tension resulting from the dominance of a woman over an eroticized man's body made vulnerable in his unconsciousness, proven vulnerable in its death. The real body, need it be said, does not exist as an unmediated entity. Once it is understood as a set of features rather than a neutral vessel, the represented body becomes subject to explication. Rather than in, uh, a priori and intact, the imaged body enters history and the social discourses concerning actual women. Fragmentation is constitutive of the actual as distinct from the formal unity of the ideal figure, the figure outside agency, class, and historical contingency. What this also means is that style is conflated with figural particularity. The artist's use of brown shadows becomes not an aesthetic decision independent of the signification of the female body, but an attribute of the woman herself. Brownness speaks to her class and to her hygiene. As we have seen, <clears throat> several critics see on her body a dirtiness which marks her as a woman of bad life. I am describing technically awkward passages, but here within the context of a revolutionary politics and the fragility of the allegorical enterprise, technical shortcomings exceed formal concerns. 
incorrect drawing of the female personification could be read as women's impropriety, as well as her incorrect motivation. Supportive and oppositional critics alike saw the disintegration of Liberty's body as something other than mere technical incompetence. Instead, the debate over affected incorrectness was a particularly modern one. If the normative allegorical body is a seamless whole to which external signs can be appended, the body of Delacroix's liberty was, according to critics, irredeemably fragmented, thereby permitting each part to be read as an attribute, not only of her character and her class, but also of the revolution itself. One could add that the revolution was compromised by the very fact that she could be seen as a composite of particular features. Both positive and negative criticisms of Delacroix's painting recognized this possibility of a compromised revolution. The painting was therefore re for resented by some whose mythology held that the revolution had resolved all the tensions of the social order. But for others, and this is my key claim, the incorrectness of Delacroix's picture truthfully represented the unresolved tensions and contradictions of the violent struggle. Revolution's force, its cracking open of social and political fictions, its revelation of fissures, was best represented by a picture equally riven by contradictions, by dissonance, by vectors of force. And Delacroix's strangely unresolved personification of liberty was key to his picture's achievement. According to the critic for the Revue de Paris, for example, the figure of liberty acted spontaneously. She aroused her lovers who were represented by Del Delacroix as hardly beautiful messieurs and elegant toilettes. The critic lamented that others demand the finest and most suave tones, the most gracious poses, figures who are less people, literally, um, one peuple, right? He, by contrast, positively associates the undisciplined status of the prostitute or the socially promiscuous woman with spontaneity and immediacy. Liberty, quote, the strong woman who is called neither the movement nor the resistance nor the juste milieu has taken up the flag. This notion of not being fixed by political identification or terminology is related to the critic's argument that liberty was initially manifested without self-consciousness about her representation. Here, the loose woman becomes the figure for spontaneous, authentically motivated action. To appreciate how incorrectness and sexual promiscuity could be deployed to represent the revolution of 1830, it is necessary finally to introduce Barbier's poem, La Curie, The Query, that was written immediately after the July days in August 1830. As we have seen in the positive criticism, poem and picture were consistently paired. I'm not claiming an origin or an influence for Delacroix's painting, but Barbier's poem offers striking parallels to the stylistic strategies employed by Delacroix's critics. That is to say, Barbier establishes oppositional social and stylistic categories in order to represent the Revolution of July. Moreover, he specifically exploits the discourse of prostitution in order to sustain an authentic and viable figure of liberty. What critics understood in common when they read Barbier and viewed the painting by Delacroix was a strategy for inflecting an area of systematic ugliness in the social world in order to redeem the sense of a lost revolution. As in the reviews of Delacroix's painting, Barbier's poetry makes a direct claim for the relationship between style and political efficacy. Barbier's prologue to his collection directly addresses the issue of a crude style. If my verse is too crude, if its tongue is unbridled, this is as it sounds today in a brazen century. The coarseness of his verse, its unfettered tongue, is necessitated by the times, and speech must be dirtied. Oops. Cynicism of manners must dirty speech. Hatred of evil engenders hyperbole. My rude and gross verse is honest at base. 
Dirty or sal, the adjective that is so often attached to the figure of liberty in the salon criticism here becomes a word of praise. Exaggerated forms of speech, such as hyperbole, are exercised as an oppositional language combating evil, a slap in the face of propriety and prudishness. Dirty is not just a pejorative social designation, as Nikos Hajinikolaou would argue, but a stylistic quality that is ascribed to viable art. Again, as in the criticism, systematic ugliness is not an isolated aesthetic effort, effect. Rather, Barbier relies on this style to make claims to the authentic representation of political and social experience. And significantly, class difference is conveyed by an opposition between kinds of women. Liberty is not a countess of the noble Faubourg Saint-Germain a woman whom a cry makes fall into weakness, who puts on white and crimson. She is instead, finally we get the passage, a strong woman with powerful breasts, and I want you all to think about what powerful breasts might mean. A grating voice, I think Delacroix didn't know, a grating voice and heavy features, who with sun-darkened skin and fire in her eyes, agile and striding, Note that the countess here is precisely located socially and geographically, but her body evaporates beneath the powdery surface of an affected delicacy. Corporeality is exhaled in a swoon. She is merely a series of surface effects to be contrasted to a strong woman with, yes, powerful breasts, brown skin, a raucous voice, fiery eyes, a large stride, a large flank. Zigzagging from breast to voice to skin to eyes to legs to flank, the description flies back and forth from body to head. Barbier ignores the conventional stratification of the body in which the head, specifically the face, is given preeminence. In addition, his adjectives are broadly, even coarsely applied and remain close to the body's physicality. Unlike representations of a woman which divide the body into a series of metaphors, your hair is sunshine, your eyes orbs, Barbier employs a purposefully descriptive mode. There is a kind of refusal to defer the body to terms which do not share its materiality. In describing the personification of liberty as a woman of the people, the poet stubbornly adheres to a metonymic rather than metaphoric mode of description. The real is this poet's primary field of reference. Barbier also exploits a discourse of prostitution in order to sustain an authentic and viable figure of liberty. As in the criticism of Delacroix's painting, common class and common style become positive attributes. Part of the mythology that Barbier shares in common with Delacroix's critics is the associations of prostitution with an undisciplined area of social life. Relying on a familiar narrative of Liberty's life since 1789, repeatedly deployed, for instance, in political caricatures, Barbier goes a step further and turns his chronicle of the revolution into a harlot's progress. Liberty's life begins with her bold air, her allures of a girl. For five years, she has put the entire people into, in heat. Already, even in 1789, according to Barbier, liberty is marked as a prostitute, putting the people in heat. But as war appears, she discards her first lovers to become a vivandière in the canteen of Napoleon. Almost always beautiful, always nude, save a tricolor scarf, liberty reappears in the midst of the scrap pile barricades of July. Barbier's reliance on prostitution anticipates and simultaneously undermines reactionary denunciation of Delacroix's liberty as a loose working class woman. I want to stress here that Barbier's sophisticated poem challenges scholars who offer an overly simplistic reading of Delacroix's liberty as a sexualized and thereby real woman of the people. And I'm thinking of Herrick Hobsbawm, but also T.J. Clark. Instead, Barbier reminds us that this particular kind of woman was only one term in a field of specific cultural and literary conventions. If there is an evocation of class, in the words of Barbier, it is a class position inscribed relationally and in allegory. Rather than abstract claims to easy, stable relations, 
as in conventional allegory, which stabilizes meaning by effacing conflict and contradictions. Barbier's allegory of the streets relies on ambiguity, slippage, and the confusion of the sensible difference between the material and the mythological. And that's a quote. The poem's uh, liberty, like that of Delacroix, is not a unified body, but a suspension of terms, goddess, genie, or woman. Some might say that, well, some might see that suspension otherwise as deviance, perhaps deception. For some, liberty in 1830 and in Delacroix's painting resembled not so much a personification of a political ideal as a personification of fraud, two-faced, dissonantly embodied, and hiding frightening secrets beneath her skirt. Let, it, let me conclude with Heinrich Heine's criticism of Delacroix's painting, wherein he admits to the painting's artistic defects, but celebrates Delacroix's achievement of, quote, a truth, a reality, an originality in which we find the real physiognomy of the days of July. The German critic deploys an old device, the dialogue, in order to allow a child innocently to pose uncomfortable questions to her father. Who, the daughter asks, is the dirty lady? Why doesn't she wear a chemise or blouse? Her father can comfortably reply that liberty isn't lily white, and the goddess of freedom seldom has a chemise. Rather, liberty turns her anger against those who wear clean linen. But the father experiences a sudden discomfort. He instinctively tugs at the linen cuffs over his long, idle hands, quote unquote. He had been entertaining a liberal, ironic relation to the events of July, but he cannot sustain his irony. His tone changes. He turns to a man in power, your eminence, and reveals the fears created by Delacroix's painting. Should the Republicans succeed today in having some old woman shot by the National Guard at the Port Saint-Denis, then they would bear the sacred corpse round the boulevards the mob would go mad, and we should have a new revolution. The disenfranchised and inactive old woman is an empty term that through violence suddenly attains significant import. The body of a woman becomes a general symbol, not of social unity, but violence against a class. The man with the clean linen imagines the danger of a potentially victimized woman as an incitement to revolution. A woman's body, otherwise politically insignificant, is too easily assigned a signification that exceeds its corporeality. While Heine's elegant viewer fears working class martyrdom, the greatest danger suggested by the represented female body is the constant threat that any insignificant material will slip into the mythological. Shadows slip into the filth of the lower order, and truth becomes discord. The neutral vessel particularly bears the burden of debate. It is the woman's body that registers the mixture of the allegorical and the actual, and that draws attention to semantic as well as bodily fragmentation. Such a strange melange represents a cultural strategy that is one of the techniques of painting and poetry, and also that of revolution. Thank you. Mark Gottlieb and I have really the impossible task of, of commenting, making some comments uh, um, about Darcy's uh, paper. Uh, impossible because um, I only just heard it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even um, though it's 25 years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, but it, it I guess I could have shared it. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, uh, I've, uh, Darcy and I have really met only a few times, um, really only a few times. But, I, but I've heard her speak um, on a number of occasions, and um, it, uh, it's really uh, a, spe uh, it's a special thing to, to hear her speak. Um, it's a very hard thing to comment, because she, her, her papers are, um, um, her discourse is so, so rich and compelling. It's a little bit like the Mahler Symphony. You just want to turn the radio off after and, and just sit in <laughs> silence and, and, and absorb her account. Um, I can't do that. Um, 
but uh, I did notice that, li like Mahler, uh, their, um, her paper today had a, a kind of elegiac quality, um, and very specifically citing um, her own uh, work as a, as a graduate student and going back in some way to revisit uh, this picture and revisit the experience of trying to account uh, for a very famous picture and provide a new account. And, and there's aspect, I want to speak a little bit more about that elegiac sensibility and um, that I heard in her paper and try and, try and lay it out for you. Um, Darcy was more specific. She said it came um, not just out originally from her master's thesis, but it, it brought her back to, to that time and moment when she wrote it. Um, uh, which was perhaps a few years later after I wrote mine, maybe the late 80s or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course it has to be the late 80s because even though we don't know each other and our formations were, were very different, um, there was something in her account that I really recognized from my own uh, experience as a graduate student and, and let me just talk, talk about that. Um, what I really recognized and felt and saw and took so much pleasure in for one thing, was um, how she um, situated the picture, and situate is really too simple a word, but in this incredibly rich um, textual context of the, of the picture's response at the time. And um, that really means that I can see Darcy sitting in the library, standing, waiting in line at the <laughs> Bibliothèque Nationale uh, for the privilege of being able to read a really grainy microfilm. I can't, <laughs> so we, we saw dozens and dozens of, of critical interventions around um, and about the picture and in relation to the picture that uh, Darcy so beautifully packaged for us in her, her presentation. But uh, what that really um, uh, recalls for her, I think, as she dipped into that was the sort of this horrified recollections of all those months spent and sometimes years um, uh, at the mercy of the the, the French, the French, the, <laughs> the French library <laughs> system, say, yeah. and as, as Darcy mentioned, it it's <sighs> not only takes her back to an era uh, where the incredible labor of of scholars at that time to find this stuff, it's with a certain uh, we shed a kind of quiet and even bitter tear because now our undergraduates can do this work in their <laughs> dorm room at 11 p.m. <laughs> While, while eating Twinkies and drinking Coke because it, it's all digitized uh, and word searchable. Uh, two things that we didn't know, you know, hadn't even been invented when, when um, this work was first done. And so I, I felt this, I shed this quiet tear as watching, um, watching this un unbelievable amount of work that uh, in a sense now has sort of vaporized um, back when you know we as art historians had to walk uphill both ways to and from the library as it were um, um, so I, I, I really felt that 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 moment and I know there are other people in this room probably who, who feel yeah. it too but um, let me just say that the 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 power of this paper is not just in the richness um, uh, of all the textual uh, commentary around the picture. Uh, it's not just about trawling through newspapers at the time in search of what someone said. It's, it's what, what's really admirable and, and quite special, I think, in the way that Darcy approaches her subject is the, the, the fact that all of these uh, all of this criticism is really subject, submitted to interpretation, no less than the picture itself. It's not there to provide evidence of its reception, but really to help build up the unstable, critical uh, field within which and around which this work was uh, produced. And, and it, it's really admirable and interesting um, to see that pressure put textually, to, to see the words, the text being interrogated and interpreted uh, no less than the picture itself, and the picture in that, uh, and in that um, manner becoming so much more complicated as, as a living, angry, difficult object uh, that, as we saw, uh, audiences at the time struggled momentously to try and understand and frequently uh, did not. Let me, one, one more thing let me add, because I realize I don't have a lot of time, but um, another um, very special feature of Darcy's discourse is her ability to do 
um, what we saw today, ability to do what might seem almost impossible to take an iconic work of art, so iconic that it features on dollar bills, I mean on francs or euros and, and so on and so forth, and uh, a, a picture that we have seen so many times that it might seem like we couldn't even see it again or never want to see it again. And, and despite that, to make us really see it anew. So uh, um, Darcy, all that work uh, finding uh, that criticism uh, is still put to the service of a, a, an amazingly rich interrogation of the picture itself. I, this, is, this is one of those scholars that you can never look at the same picture again after she has um, uh, finished her interrogation of it or, or started her interrogation of it. And that's a very special art historical quality indeed um, that also speaks to the urgency of the historical moment in which she was formed as a scholar where the, the social context or the social field of, uh, around the work of art wasn't just treated as a social field but was really uh, put in the service of a new and powerful interrogation of the work of art as doing that kind of um, complicated work uh, in itself. Now I um, I was going to go on and cite a third. Um, I talked about the criticism. I talked about the uh, the commitment to re uh, a reinvigorated reading of the object. Uh, the great third here, in terms of Darcy's intellectual formation, is the attention to the body um, and the male body, the female body, and a reading of that body is not a in, not in stylistic terms or not in iconographic terms, but really is riven with um, all of these conflicts that the critics at the time um, in her own reading of the picture um, brings uh, to the surface. But I have a feeling that I am out of time. And, and, and uh, what I want to do is open up uh, the the, the to open up the paper uh, to questions. I have plenty of questions myself, but I, I think I've perhaps said one or two things that can put the, her intervention, her elegiac intervention, <laughs> into some context, and, and for that I want to thank her. So, so I think just some, some questions for, for Darcy now. Well, I want to say first that, um, yeah, Mark and I overlap in work but have not overlapped socially and I did not pay him to give such a lovely <laughs> tribute to my, to my <laughs> paper which was very generous and also very um, astute about our own pasts in pre-Gallica um, archives with the little espresso machines um, for one franc being a very big part of how we survived. Um, but I would love to hear questions in, from Mark and from others if anyone would like to bring them to bear. I think my paper is interesting in relationship to Nina's um, introduction with the issues both of classicism and deviation from it, but also the issues of, you know, uh, what she describes not only as the ebosh to painting um, transition, but also the issue of the meticulous. Um, so in some ways I felt like uh, Nina presented um, a much more positive <laughs> evaluation of Delacroix, and I, you know, introduced him as the young, sort of slovenly, uh, quick mover. Um, but that is partly a response to the two moments of, of his career. But I, I open it up to questions. David has a question over there. Do you want to just speak up, David? Apparently, you don't need this because your mic is still on. Oh, I see. I think this is all about filming. You presented a lot of um, contemporary dialogue on Delacroix's work. Yeah. What, what did he have to say to his critics? Did he have anything to say to them? Yeah. Um, I have to say I didn't, I haven't done that work, I'm not sure. I mean, you know he came up with his own um, somewhat, we might think, I mean, we have different quotes of Delacroix about, you know, I couldn't fight for the revolution, so I'll paint for it, and Alexandre Dumas' uh, description of him as being quite frightened until he saw the tricolor, uh, no, actually, the Napoleonic symbol flying from uh, Notre Dame or something. I mean, we have different little moments. 
I mean, I think we need to think of the painting as an incitement and also a response to that world post Auguste Barbier's poem. But as to him responding to the critics, I don't know. And if you know of anything as a Delacroix specialist, share it with us. But no, I don't know. Nina, do you know of him speaking to, the crit to his own critical reception in 1831? Um, thank you. Um, first to tell you that this was a dazzling paper, oh, dazzlingly written, as usual. I, I mean, I shouldn't say these things that obvious when anyone knows you, but every time I'm taken, uh, I would say, very kind. ever renewed surprise, uh, mm -hmm. if you want. Um, in terms of his critics, um, Delacroix, uh, you know, he has mentioned them incidentally, but never in a targeted way. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I haven't done the research you've done to be able to um, kind of seek out one-to-one uh, -one responses, for example, to, right. to these. So um, there is a semi-apocryphal text that um, we actually published in this Companion to Delacroix, mm -hmm. edited by mm -hmm. Beth Wright. Right. Um, at it was published anonymous in, was it L'Artiste? I forget. Um, about Delacroix begrudging his critics and the whole salon system. But again, it's in a generic way, and yep. I think it postdates the it's liberty. It's usually later than it's this It's usually moment. later. This is a, you know, right. this painting is a, you know, I remember when I spoke on Kios at the Delacroix Symposium 25 years ago, uh, there was a French scholar who said, yes, but you know, Kios, it was just an experiment. And I said, yeah, <laughs> uh, that was really cool about it, wasn't it? And it was sort of dismissive of any right, argument right, right. I could make about it because it was just so young and experimental yeah. before he became Delacroix. But in a way, Liberty now, in sort of retrospect, yeah. seems equally early and um, yeah. a kind of last gasp before we suddenly see the, the painter who's doing all these much larger uh, you know, decorative yeah. um, projects and also, you know, many more small paintings, et cetera. So, um, uh, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. hard to get his voice from this early moment. It's hard, especially the kind of targeted thing that the mm -hmm. question seems yeah. to be prompting. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to, you know, that comes to mind is uh, always amazed me that Stendhal wrote this fairly negative review of the Masters yeah. of Kios, as you well know. Right. And nevertheless, De La Croix never cut him off, let's say. Right. <laughs> I mean, he right. essentially continued to have a relationship. In fact, he's been admired, bail, as he goes in the journal uh, for his wit. Right. And so uh, I would say, you know, it depends on the critics. I mean, he obviously had something about De La Cluse and the neoclassicists, but yep. in this case, n I can't say, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But thank so you. I'll pass the baton. To okay. Else. Does anybody else have a question for Darcy? No. There's one at the back, and your view is it on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. The implication that I got from your talk was that the, that you didn't feel that uh, Delacroix. Well, yeah. I just want to know, did they know each other? Were they friends? Is there any basis for me? I, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that, I must say. Um, that's part of the problem with giving work from long ago. I probably did know, and now I don't know. Um, and I don't have Alzheimer's yet, but it might be, it might be in a little while. Um, I'm afraid I don't know, and I felt like that sentence was a little overstated in that um, when I say I'm not describing this as an origin or an influence, in that it, it, the poem circulated after August 1830, and w I feel like I look at those problematic, typically problematic breasts of Delacroix and say those are breasts that are frightened to death by the, by the terminology, strong breasts, f powerful breasts. What could he make of that? Um, and you see how different they are than the ones that are in the sketches. So I do think he's probably interacting with Barbier, but I don't remember the specific uh, evidence we have about um, how much they knew one another, et cetera. If I ever chose to publish any of this, I would do that work, but I'm afraid I'm, 
unable to answer it right now. As I recall from Tim Clark, that um, the best response when asked a very specific causal question like that is uh -huh. always that it's historically opposite. <laughs> I've remembered this for historically the Historically opposite. Opposite. I, yeah, so. I think it, and I think it might be even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. you, it's a good question. Thank you, Darcy, for your great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, I was really struck by all the examples of the figures that didn't have, that were missing a leg, Yeah. Um, the, the, the one-legged women. And um, in relationship to, um, you know, uh, Nina's point about finishing the work in the imagination, right. I just wonder how you see that <laughs> in terms of, that somehow, yeah. how do you think Delacroix wanted the figure of liberty to kind of come together, all these contradictions that you described to come together in the viewer's imagination? I guess I don't give him that much credit um, <laughs> in, in this regard. I mean, I, I really think he was being quite strategic and um, pragmatic in figuring out what he needed where. <laughs> um, and that a lot like David with Thersilia, there was never an assumption for some reason that the two legs would be on the ground. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I see that absence as something chosen to provide an imaginative place. Again and again, that is so exacerbating of, of you know, negative views of the figure to have a sense that she, uh, that one doesn't know her in entirety. And I just think he was strategically sort of making figures up as he needed them for those little carved out spaces. I realized the person who asked the question wasn't David. There's David. I called, uh, I saw her, isn't that funny? Sorry. <laughs> this is my old friend, David O'Brien. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow it to have sort of this purposeful, we, we make the personification whole. I just think it is a three-quarter personification and that's part of its problem. Oh. Uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. Thank and you. thank you, Nina, as well. A um, couple of things fit together. So one thing that was very striking, I sort of remembered while you were discussing the critics' reactions to dirtiness yeah. Sal of mm -hmm. the body, that how Manet with Olympia is going to get exactly the same reactions, same stuff, yeah. the same stuff. So there is uh, certain critical tropes that keep on being, you know, circulated and recycled. Right. Sometimes Absolutely. with Delacroix in mind, sometimes with not. Manet produced the work in a completely different yeah. phase in French history, but it's yeah. fascinating. Isn't it fascinating the longevity? And it's kind of fascinating that Olympia has trumped liberty as the place in which we all know that happens. Absolutely. When it's so much earlier. Absolutely. Um, and it's, uh, again, Olympia is a lot about the outline, the perfunctory kind of sense of outlining. And it also moves into, um, obviously, uh, kind of colonialist issues with it being like India rubber marked by blackness and gorillas and all of that, uh, which doesn't happen in the Delacroix, but very much the same issue that darkness up against the, the nude woman is somehow um, contaminating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had one, one more question about Delacroix's legacy today. I was struck by the photographs you show from Egyptian Revolution and the feminists. Mm -hmm. I have one more photograph, but my internet is not working on my phone, so I'll show it to you later. Oh, great. The uh, revolution in Istanbul over the summer, and there's one photograph of a girl walking over the barricades with a Turkish flag. Oh, I flag. need to see this. Yeah, yeah. So could you? Oh. Could you tell us, uh, so, you uh, know, liberty uh, and uh, desire for liberty is still alive in some parts of the world. Well, Could I you tell us about the relevance of Delacroix, or, you know, why, why did you bring yeah, these images? Yeah, no, I think it's very interesting because I think art history has receded from, uh, there's a way that the politics of much of this art that was assumed to be the primary question mark in the 80s, um, you know, not only is Delacroix not being talked about, but we have to think about how we're talking about Delacroix. And the fact that uh, the notion of political revolution seems like sort of of a moment in social art history when feminism mattered and it's all behind us. There's nothing like the fact that revolution is still being enacted all over the Middle East um, 
in ways that very much cite and in, get, are engaged with an imagery that is partly, you know, uh, knowing very well Delacroix's liberty guiding the people. And it's a, it's a good reminder to our kind of complacent sense of um, having grown beyond the ardent character of our youth and our politics to uh, remember that it's still, hot, you know, the issue of martyrdom in revolution is <laughs> key and it hasn't gone away and it better wake us up that we can't just sit in museums and talk about um, style as though it doesn't have those implications. I mean, it, uh, it, I just taught the art and revolution class I teach at Berkeley and you know, Egypt was a foil throughout for me and you know, it was sort of like, wow, it's not only a foil for revolution, but now it's a foil for the Napoleonic era. And then it's, you know, it, it was like regime changes and it was kind of amazing and, and somewhat despairing and, but relevant, I think. Um, I think unfortunately we probably should move on now, but um, thank okay. you so well, much thank you, everybody. for your paper. Thank you.